Let's just pray before I say anything. Loving God, take my faltering words and thoughts of reflection and translate them into living to life and energy for all who here are present and who hear this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, one of the frustrations I have when we get to looking at the very difficult, complicated situation in the world today, whether it's to do with climate change or to do with dealing with the COVID pandemic, is people seem to want simple answers from politicians. Politicians, perhaps sometimes because they want to please people, giving some answers that are too simple. Some answers that are, are, are not actually simple at all because the whole situation is complicated. Well, when it, uh, we, we have something of that dynamic going on in the story that we've just heard about Jesus um, being um, accosted by the alliance between the um, Pharisees, the religious um, group in Judaism, very sort of traditional religious, con conservative religious group, and, and the Herodians, who um, were the sort of more political um, elite and aligned with Rome. And they come up with this um, very clever trick question to see, to try and trap Jesus, thinking that Jesus will have to answer one way or the other. You know, whose, whose image, it, it says, um, sorry, they, they, they ask him, should they pay taxes to Caesar or not? And it, when they say, should they, uh, is it permitted? Literally, uh, is it permitted? Although it's a political question in many respects, um, because um, the, the Romans were, were, had occupied the land. But nevertheless, it is a deeply religious one because according to the Torah, the land belongs to God. I think I brought this out before and it's never to be sold on in per per perpetuity um, to anybody because it belongs to God. So therefore, um, strictly speaking, according to the religious law of the Jews, um, it would be perfectly permitted not to pay taxes to Caesar. But of course, um, if Jesus answered uh, in that, uh, that it was, uh, was permitted not to pay taxes to Caesar, then, then um, or rather it was not permitted to pay taxes to Caesar, then he would get himself into deep trouble. But like, likewise, uh, with the Herodians, likewise, um, he would get himself into deep trouble with the religious people if he says um, yes. But both sides were united in one thing, they, they disagreed on, on a, lot, a lot of stuff, but they were united in understanding that Jesus was, um, was a dangerous person, um, dangerous for religion, danger for, for, for politics as well. Um, and that is incidentally as true today as it was back then. Anyway, Jesus comes up with this very wise answer. And he simply says, show me a coin, show me the coin that you use for, to pay your taxes, which was a Roman coin. And he asks them uh, the question, well, who's, uh, who, it, it says, whose image in the original, whose image is this? And that, that word image is very, very important. It, it, it wasn't um, just any, you know, who, who do you see on this? And of course, it was the image of, of Caesar, Augustus, and it would be um, on, the, on, the, on the head side and on the, on the tail side, there would be some um, inscription to do with who he was in the son of, uh, Caesar Augustus, etc., etc. Tiberius, I think it probably was at that time. But anyway, and they say, "Well, it's Caesar's, right?" And Jesus answered very wisely, "Well, give to God, to give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. This coin belongs to Caesar. It's just a just a bit of silver. That's all. But give to God what belongs to God." So, therefore, he's talking about the image. Where is the image of God? And the image of God if we understand from Genesis chapter one, is actually us human beings. Human beings, both male and female, created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. We are therefore the manifestation of the divine reality, which is beyond any description, beyond any name, beyond any ability to tie down. And yet there is that infinite variety in the human race with personality, with culture, languages, and all the rest of it. All of it, the image of God. And we are therefore to give to God, 
to serve God, to give to God that which belongs to God, which is us, our very bodies, that we have received as a gift in which to live our lives in this world. Now I want to link back into the earlier passage from Exodus. Where does the idea of image come there? Well, it is in this idea of Moses asking God to see his glory. Because the glory of God, which is the glory really means the manifestation, the physical manifestation of something. What Moses was wanting was some physical manifestation, the evidence of God's presence with him to give him the confidence to lead this very obstinate, difficult people forward into the promised land. But let's not forget that Moses actually had been speaking with God face to face already. Now, the, the people had let, let him, Moses and God, down, if you like, by creating this other image, an image that wasn't the image of God in human being, but in beastly form. Um, the, 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 the golden calf, you remember. And as a result of which God has said, I'm sorry, I, I can't go with you. My presence can't go with you. Um, you, you go, uh, but I'm, I, I can't, my presence will. And Moses was really saying, look, if you, if you don't go with us, then I'm not gonna be able to take these people into the promised land. We're no longer gonna be your chosen people. We're no longer gonna fulfill your plans. Please, please go with us. And therefore Moses was pleading with God, but he wanted that sense of assurance. And he asked for God to reveal his glory to him. And interestingly enough, God doesn't reveal his glory. He reveals his goodness to Moses, and that's good enough. Because what's important is not so much that we have tangible evidence in the physical realm of God's presence with us, but we know that his goodness is with us. And there's some very important stuff in this passage here, and I just want to touch it, touch back to it and say, well, um, and it has to do with, with um, the name, the name of God. Um, I, God says, I will make, um, I will proclaim before you the name. And in the English translation, it says the Lord. And in fact, in the original words, it would have been Yahweh, um, which is the third person uh, singular version of what God had revealed to Moses originally, when Moses was asked, who are you? And God had said, I am that I am, or I will be who I am, and I am who I will be. And now if you look just beyond that, you'll see in the text, it says, I'll be gracious and I will show mercy. Or I will be, that comes directly from the verb to be, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on who I will show mercy. So God was actually going to be very gracious and go with him. And he allows Moses to experience his goodness. Now, when it comes to the New Testament, of course, the, the Gospel of Matthew was very much a, a presentation of Jesus Christ as the new Moses. Um, and, and, and when we come to Paul's writing, which um, I, I was looking at the idea of face, and Moses was, 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 was meeting God face to face already, so I'm, I'm kind of confused. Why on earth do you want to you know, you're asking me, but you're meeting with him every day. Your, your presence is going, you know, you're, you're, you're in presence. Um, but, but, but Moses was basically saying, no, I, I don't want you just myself to, to be able to meet you face to face. I want you to be with the whole people. And so anyway, what about today? What about God's presence with us today? How are we to know God's presence? Where's the image of God today? And this is where I come to a verse, it's written by Paul, and we will find it in the second, second, second letter to the, to the church in Corinth, chapter three, verse 13. All of us with unveiled faces, 
seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. In other words, in Jesus Christ, uh, we actually have a complete image of God. And again, he says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6, for it is God who said, let your light shine out of darkness, who shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So what I'm basically saying is that that longing that Moses had to see the glory of God is a privilege that we actually have been able to see. But you say, well, the face of Jesus? Yes, but where's the face of Jesus today? Well, it's in one another. If you want proof, if you want evidence that God is with us, look at each other. And in each other, we see an image. Yes, it's in a mirror. It's reflected in a mirror. It's not actually directly face to face. But nevertheless, we are able to see something of the glory of God shining through. Especially if we understand people not from the point of view of their personality that appears on the surface, but from the essence of who they are, sometimes distorted, albeit. Sometimes we're reacting out of pain and out of fear and anger, but underneath we need to be able to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we can see that not only in one another in the church, but I believe in human beings throughout the world, even human beings who seem to be doing things in a crazy way. But we have to see beneath the surface to the essence and forgive that which is on the surface. May God bless these reflections. Amen.